Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us down tonight to speak about Standing Rock. Um, I'm going to apologize right away. My voice is kind of going, and I'm going to cry so hard. <laughs> um, yesterday was a really long day and a really long night. Um, so my part might be a little shorter than normal. And I just want to, um, little things you heard about myself, but I wanted to talk a little bit about my organization and kind of what brought me working for this, why I think Standing Rock is, is important. Um, with that, I, I want to right away let you know, um, environmental work is not my specialty, um, so I, I can't speak a lot to that. And I think when you start talking about Native American issues, the things that are affecting Native American tribes and the history that we have are very complicated and complex. So there's a lot of things that, that even I, I don't understand and I don't know and very little people know. Um, but as said, I am the communication and development manager at uh, the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families and for its Race to Equity project. Has anyone heard of the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families? <laughs> okay, so we are a public policy and advocacy organization in Madison, um, and we work to improve the lives of children and families um, across the state, and we do that um, through public policy, advocacy, research, and public education. We also have what is called the Race to Equity Project, and what that project does is it's addressing the severe racial disparities that exist in Madison between the black and white population. Um, that project has been going for about three years and we're looking to expand the project. So in the past three years, we have been doing more work with various um, populations in, in Madison and throughout the community, or throughout the state. So this is where I kind of came in, bringing in my expertise with the Native American policy and kind of <coughs> how we ended up in this position, how we're here. Um, we've been doing a lot of Native American health work also. Um, so I think many of you, most of you probably know what's going on in Standing Rock, um, but just to bring you up to speed, there is a pipeline um, that is being proposed to be built, and it's actually being constructed right now, just outside the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, Standing Rock Reservation is one of the largest um, reservations in the United States and has about 8,000 people. Um, the one thing that I want to speak to during this presentation is um, the systemic racism and the environmental racism that we're seeing um, that is connected to Standing Rock. So systemic racism is a form of racism expressed in the practices of social and political institutions. And environmental racism is low income people of color, when low income people of color are forced to live in close proximity of environmental health. Um, we're seeing both of this happening out at Standing Rock. Um, and the big thing is, is what Standing Rock is doing, how they got to this point was kind of this, this unfair way of getting there. The tribes weren't consulted. Um, they kind of maneuvered in getting these permits. Um, and really the well-being of the people was not really taken into consideration when they constructed this pipeline. I think the most shocking part of this is that the initial route of this pipeline was supposed to go through Bismarck, but the people of Bismarck, which is a predominantly white population, were like, no, this is too scary, it might harm us. So then they're like, well, let's reroute it by a reservation. You know, and we hear these stories, and this isn't the only story, we hear these stories of pipelines, we hear these stories of contaminated water, we heard a lot about Flint, Michigan. Um, so these are similar things that are happening throughout our country. Um, and I think the one thing is we are operating under systems and policies and practices and idea ideologies that can, were adopted years ago, but they continue to marginalize, oppress, and kill Native American people and its culture. Um, so it can go into a little, I mean, there's so much to talk about when you start talking about um, Standing Rock. I mean, you look at the history, you look at broken treaties, the Fort Laramie Treaty was a huge treaty um, that was that kind of paved the way for some of this because it gave the government more jurisdiction over the land and it gave <coughs> the government jurisdiction um, over the, Mississippi, or the Missouri River um, when that should rightfully be the tribes. Um, we're also, um, I mean, just kind of the genocide in general and what the tribes were forced to be, to be removed and placed in certain areas. Um, and then not acknowledging the sovereignty of the Standing Rock Sioux. 
So the government kind of tends to play this role of, I want you to be sovereign, and I want you to help yourselves, and I don't want to help you, but I don't want you to have too much sovereignty where I'm going to you know, acknowledge you when it comes to making these big decisions. Um, so Native American tribes for years have been kind of in this weird battle with the government in doing that. Um, right now, I think the US government has in place what are, uh, I don't know if they do. They're supposed to be doing tribal consultations when certain things are gonna impact tribes. And I know here in Wisconsin, we also have this um, legislation where um, the government is supposed to be consulting with tribes. And um, for the most part, I think here in Wisconsin, it often happens, but nothing is ever mandated. So you have this consultation where the tribes get together with the administration or the governor and they talk about things, but nothing ever comes of it. The, the government doesn't ever have to like honor anything that the tribes have want. Um, so we kind of just, there's a lot of continued frustration, um, broken promises, and what that is ultimately leading up to is, I mean, a lot of anger and a lot of um, good anger though because it's it's building this community up. I think it's called attention to our other tribes in throughout the country are seeing what's happening there. We know what can happen to us. So I think that's uh, forcing the tribes to kind of build solidarity and protest out there. Um, I think that's kind of like the general background that I wanted to give. I think um, you guys will be way more interested in hearing from Danielle. Danielle has actually been out to Standing Rock um, and she's a lawyer so she can speak it way better than I can and explain things. Okay, I'll give her a call. Okay, um, Daniel, Danielle Delaney um, is the Public Humanities Fellow for the Race to Equity Project at the Wisconsin Center for Children and Families. Um, she's working on her dissertation at UW in political science, and she's a fellow at the Center for the Humanities. Um, her work is a comparative analysis of the legal discourse of indigeneity in the United States, Russia, and internationally, and how indigenous activists engage that discourse. She can explain it. <laughs> uh, and she was the senior policy analyst for the National Council of Urban Indian Health in Washington, D.C. Give a big hand for Danielle. Hi, my name is Danielle Delaney. Um, like Winona, my voice is a little shaky because last night was somewhat upsetting. Um, not currently scared. Um, so, as was mentioned, I went out to Standing Rock in October. I'm going, I've been going out once a week every month since I got back from Moscow um, and providing legal support, um, basically legal representation to the, to the extent that I can because I'm not barred in North Dakota working on that, um, for the water protectors um, and people who've been arrested. So I've been involved uh, with the Civil Liberties Defense Fund. So if you're looking for people to uh, send donations to, Civil Liberties Defense Fund is pretty much the only organization currently in the United States who they're always on the ground when mass protests and mass arrests are happening. They do, that. that's basically what Lauren and Cooper Benson do is all of that type of work. And they tend to be the legal representation for some of our more um, intense protesters, you know, the ones who chain themselves to things and refuse to leave. That's who they're representing. Um, and also with the National Lawyers Guild through the Red Owl Legal Collective, they're doing a huge amount of the legal work. And so if you're looking for how to help, they're definitely one. So I just wanted to give a, a quick um, sort of description of what's going on in the camps, at least from my experience while I was there. Um, I know a lot of the media that's coming out of North Dakota, the print media, has a lot of words about, you know, the protesters are extremists, the camps are dangerous, all the rest of that. There's th three main rules about the camps is that you may not bring any alcohol, guns, or drugs into the camp, that this is a prayerful place, and that this is a spiritual place. Um, the, the movement, the water protector movement, is indigenous-led, and it's led by tribal leaders, elders, and 
to traditional healers, which does mean it, it has a little bit of a different focus for I mean, those of us who've been involved with like mass protests before. They can get kind of intense and shouty. This, these protests are not like that, generally speaking. It tends to be very focused on prayerful interactions, which makes some of the rest really kind of funny because <laughs> you'll get protesters who are charged with uh, incitement to riot, riot, and all the rest of that, and then you see like video phones of 13 teenage, you know, Lakota Sioux boys in a prayer circle with sage praying, and this is this is what they they're trying to charge them with riot. Like really, really guys. Okay, um, sorry, I get a little huffy about that one. Um, the there are two main camps that are currently, um, I guess, under operation or or organization. The first is Sacred Stone, and that was the first camp to go out. It is on tribal lands. You can see where the pipeline's going to come from Sacred Stone. Sacred Stone is on tribal lands, which means it cannot be raided. Cops have no jurisdiction on the reservation. BIA police do, but jurisdiction is an interesting question when you start talking about criminality, and uh, particularly if you're non-native on a reservation. Um, but the police from the county are not allowed onto um, tribal lands, or they have no jurisdiction if they come. So, so Sacred Stone is the place, it's the, the main place for all ceremony, it's a very, it's where all prayer takes place, and it's where um, you know, sweat lodges and, and all the rest of that work, and it's sort of the center, it's the heart of everything that's going on, it's, that's at Sacred Stone. Um, it's also, if anybody saw the story, it's it's where the baby was born. Yeah. There's been two. Oh. There, there have now been two children who have been born at the camps. It's super exciting. Um, the other main camp is um, Acheris Hakuin, which is the one of the forward deploy camps or the the frontline camps, and this is where a lot of the frontline action will be from. Is from this camp. It's actually considered to be the overflow camp, and it's bigger. This camp is on Army Corps of Engineers land, technically, which gives it, a, makes us a little nervous about the camp because we have permits through the Army Corps of Engineers to have the camp and to have structures on it, but they could revoke those, right? And that, that could, so we could lose that camp. And it, so it's, it, that is the one that has a more un, uncertain legal status. Sacred Stone is on tribal lands, it's perfectly fine. A chain is a little bit more um, unsteady. Then there's Red Warrior is another camp. It's right next to um, a chain Sakuin. It's slightly smaller. It is also a forward deploy or frontline action camp. Um, and then there was another camp that got set up that was that was right in front of where the pipeline was going to go through, and that camp was the 1868 camp, named after the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. That camp is the one that's been, that was raided October 24th, where the, the 113 people were arrested. That was during the raid of that camp. Um, so when, when you hear, oh no, all the camps have been raided, no, just, just this one, which was a relatively new camp that was set up deliberately to be in the way, like dead center blocking where this was gonna go. Um, so Sacred Stone's okay, Ochai de Sakuin is okay, Red Warrior still okay, the 1868 camp was raided, and that's where a lot of people were arrested. Um, the current legal status for the pipeline is somewhat complicated. So the way in which they got, they being the Dakota Access Pipeline, the way in which they set up the permissions for this pipeline is that they didn't get permissions for the entire pipeline as it was spanning North Dakota. They did it in sections. I think they have like something like 130 some odd um, permit requests. So it was section by section by section. And the, the trick with what they did is that then it never hit the impo environmental impact thresholds that would, one, trigger a stricter review of the Army Corps of Engineers, and two, trigger um, the type of consultation, state to state consultation with Standing Rock Reservation. So the only time that consultation got triggered was when it was right next to when they were applying for the the, um, the permit that's right next to Standing Rock 
reservation. At that point, tribal consultation was triggered, but meaningful consultation has never occurred. So, and the other way that the, from my understanding, and I might be a little shaky on this, my understanding is that the way that the, the pipeline set up its application for permits is that they did it as they were building. So as they moved down the state and were, laying, were doing the grading of that entire thing, they would apply for permits. So the tribe almost didn't realize exactly how close this thing was going to come and where, and that the fact that it was going under the um, Osake uh, Lake. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't quite realize it was going to go through that lake until it was pretty close. Right? So they lost time in part because North Dakota's access is lawyers were quite clever in how they structured this. So that's the basis of a, of a court case that Standing Rock currently has against the Army Corps of Engineers saying, one, you haven't done the proper, um, you haven't done the proper risk assessment, you haven't done the environmental assessment correctly, this entire process of the way that you did it is completely wrong, and meaningful consultation never occurred because of how you've done this. Um, there has been some noise that Oh no, the tribe has lost their court case. They didn't lose their court case. September 9th, the judge did not issue the injunction which they had petitioned for, but they haven't lost the case. The case is still ongoing. So that's still happening. Um, one of the big changes legally is October 20th, the Army Corps um, sent a site visit to the bulldoze site. So there was a number of sacred spaces and um, burials archaeological finds that the tribe had discovered that then literally two days after the tribe announced the discovery of these burial places, uh, North Dakota Access Pipeline bulldozed them, um, which is incredibly illegal under the, the National Historical Act, but Preservation Act, but that's also part of the, the court case. Um, but the Army Corps of Engineers went out to those sites to do a survey because if it is found that um, if it is found that the North Dakota um, access has been in violation of the National Historic Preservation Act by destroying these um, sacred sites, they may not have they legally speaking they cannot have the final sets of permits that they need in order to continue building. So this is this is a big uh, thing, but no no. Um, the Army Corps hasn't issued a, a finding yet, so we're still waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers to say something um, about that. October 24th is, is when you saw the big militarized police raid where everybody was arrested. That was the 1868 camp. Um, there's a civil suits that are being generated out of that camp um, because of the treatment of water protectors and how they've been treated. So there's, um, people are definitely collecting information. There's gonna be civil suits coming out of that. There was Obama gave a interview on November 1st where he had some statements that made it sound like they were looking at reviewing and maybe rerouting the pipeline, but those were very non-committal. Um, tribal chairman of Standing Rock Reservation, um, Chairman R. Chamble, asked has asked the administration to, you know, <laughs> do something. Um, that hasn't happened. And then November 3rd, the tribe's independent expert found that the government's environmental assessment of the Dakota Access Pipeline was inadequate. Um, and then the tribe, on the basis of that letter, has sent out a series of letters to the different agencies asking for regulatory um, review, an additional level of review of the pipeline. So that's kind of the legal framework. Any questions about all of that? Yeah, what I'm afraid of is they're going to drill that underneath the slide, yeah. and then the whole thing becomes moot. So, basically, what people are trying to do is prevent that. In this case, winter is our friend because it's it makes drilling harder. So, what has happened is that they that Dakota Access has been asked to involuntary has been asked to voluntarily cease um, drilling construction. Um, which they have ignored, and they're moving even without the permits. So what may end up happening is e they may put in that pipeline and then 
then what we're looking at is damages to the company. And so what may happen is that you drive up the costs for Dakota Access so high that even if they do get the pipeline in, the cost to actually use it is so high that they don't. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the strategies. Ideally, we stop them before they can drill. Mm -hmm. um, but that requires, at this point in time, Obama to do something. Right now, he's the best hope to stop things. Um, any other questions about Judy? So, so you said what he said on November 1st was asking him to review the... So November, November 1st, Obama had an interview where he said that his administration was looking at rerouting the pipeline, okay. sort of like what they did with Keystone XL. Um, <coughs> But the wording was um, non-committal and pretty vague. Oh, so didn't he ask the, the Army Corps of Engineers to hold off until that was done, or he didn't? He hasn't so far, but oh. the tribe has called oh. for that to, to, based on the president's words, for that oh. to happen. Oh, and that's not happening? Not yet. Um, there's a certain sense that maybe people are waiting to see what the outcome of this election was going to be before moving, <coughs> but now, Really need to be the Obama administration to do something. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the Army Corps and the Dakota Pipeline and construction of the Corps? Okay. And then I'd be a lot confused about the Okay, so the Army Corps of Engineers, the, the interesting thing about this pipeline is for most major construction projects that's going to go over or through any sort of public lands, government controlled lands, you have to go through the Army Corps of Engineers to get, they do an environmental impact assessment for the EPA. The EPA doesn't do environmental impacts themselves. Either you hire an expert, which can be you know, contested if people want to contest it, um, and you provide it to the EPA, which the EPA may or may not approve. And if it's going through any sort of public lands, the Army Corps of Engineers will also do an assessment. Now, there's a requirement that um, there's a higher level of scrutiny depending upon how much water is going to flow over a pipeline and by breaking it up into small chunks they never triggered that water amount uh, which is also part of the the court case um, so the how the army corps of engineers has gotten involved is that the pipeline technically doesn't go over tribal lands it goes over Army Corps of Engineer lands that are right next to the reservation, which is where the camps are, right? Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers has the final sets of permits to say you can have an easement over this land in order to build your pipeline. The way that Dakota Access has mostly constructed this pipeline is through private property. They've gotten easements, they've paid for easements, they've paid people off to build a pipeline under underneath their ranching lands by and large. Um, so this is the big trip for them, is this particular section. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, some of the states have been sending police out. I'm not, I'm not getting how that's triggered or who pays for that. Including yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. So, that was actually something I was going to talk a little bit about how people can help and one of the things that you can do is if your county has sent um, police to support uh, the Morton County Sheriff, write them and tell them that you don't think this is an appropriate use of funds. So, and it's also causing things to be more violent um, in the, the police and water protector confrontations when they happen because these are cops from the outside who do not know these communities. Um, and there's a certain degree of jurisdictional tension within the police forces themselves and a certain degree of um, attempt to prove who's the bigger badass with the bigger toys, right? So when they come in and somebody has a lot of militarized toys, they kind of want to show them off to everybody else and that causes a lot of problems with the protesters. Um, the jurisdiction technically, it depends on how the governors of the two states who are sending uh, police forces in have structured their agreement as to, in terms of who has jurisdiction or over their police forces and who is paying for it. So 
I'm not sure what the, the agreement between Walker and Ap APCOM, I can't remember the governor for North Dakota's name off the top of my head, um, have, how they've structured that agreement. But basically what a governor can do um, is they can enter into an agreement with another governor to provide support. Generally you see this when there's an emergency relief effort going on. Um, so that's the reason why the, the governor of North Dakota has declared the protests an emergency is so that he can enter into these agreements with other governors. That, I mean, that, that's exactly why he did it. Um, also, and to bring in the National Guard who are manning the checkpoints. So there's three main checkpoints in order to get to the camp set up on the, on the highways that are manned by National Guard members with very big guns. Um, somewhat intimidating. Uh, there are also now manning a checkpoint near Bismarck and so uh, for people who are coming out with the donations, tell them to be very careful about going through Bismarck because they're confiscating donations. Mm -hmm. They've started confiscating donations if, you, if you're bringing them through the Bismarck area, so don't go through Bismarck. Avoid that. If you can enter into the reservation from a different area, not through the 1806 highway, and then come through the camp, come to the camps through the reservation. That's the safest way to do it, because then you won't, you won't go by the park. Um, the the police. Camps, it's pretty illegal. Really yes. Um, so the ones that I've heard from other people who've gone out there is uh, aiding and abetting the criminal conspiracy, um, smuggling. <laughs> Which like food, really? Uh, so uh, these are the types of claims that they're using to confiscate food. But then it's on you to, you know, basically go into court, fight them, get the, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to bring back. Um, so that's that's been the struggle, especially particularly. It sounds like they're not necessarily going after food so much, but like building supplies is what they've confiscated a lot of. Um, so that that was kind of their trouble. Does that answer the question? Does that I answer? heard that there was a semi for building supplies going to the reservation. Were they able to get there? Yes. Um, and so what the what the camps are asking for is actually um, gift cards to Menards. They don't have a Home Depot near them. Um, and what they'll do is buy supplies at Menards bring them through the reservation to, to Sacred Stone, and then just shuttle them across the river on boats. Mm -hmm. So avoid checkpoints and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, sure. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of structures they're building, or maybe like how they make structures? Um, so right now they're really asking for those, um, what are they called, pallets, wood pallets, so that they can raise the teepees and the yurts off the ground, and then they'll stuff them with hay to give you a, a yeah, it is. Because they, they can't, especially on Army Corps of Engineer, um, have structures that are too permanent. So like, they can't necessarily build a fully enclosed area, so it has to be able to be broken down relatively quickly, um, which is the reason why they're using um, teepees on the, on the pallets, um, yurts. Uh, <laughs> the indigenous people of Mongolia sent Thirty-two yurts. Yeah, they're really gorgeous. They're really, really pretty, um, and very warm. So this is the type of structures. Kids and elders will stay in these structures. Otherwise, it's a lot of cold weather, like four-season um, tents that they're asking if you're sending donations. Um, I grew up in Alaska, so I just bought all of my stuff home. <laughs> I have a very large dog. Um, but that, that's a lot of what people are doing is staying in, either that you stay in the, the teepees, which are communal um, and sex segregated, or you're staying in um, generally tents and camping stuff that you brought yourself. If you don't have anything and you don't want to stay at one of, in one of the, the yurts or the teepees, um, they do have tents that, they, that have been donated that they're giving to the protesters. They now have, I think, something close to like 3,000 people yeah, I heard, uh, I don't know if this is a little more than a rumor or not, but I heard the two officers quit, turned in their badge, said we didn't come here 
to do what you're asking us to do? I've, I've seen that story, but I haven't seen it confirmed. Yeah, that's not word about it. It's just, yeah, know, so I mean, I've, I've heard that when I was there, most of the officers who are from Morton County, uh, they won't look you in the eye. They won't engage. Yeah. I mean, they're, they were pretty respectful when we were there last, but that's, that's been a, a while. Um, but they also weren't fully stormtroopered up. <laughs> and that's, that seems to be the big difference, indicator that the, the, their, your interactions with the police are going to be different. So when they're wearing their normal uniforms, things will probably be fine, but when they're in their full riot gear, things probably won't. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I heard that um, Donald Trump is I don't know what the ownership structure of the Dakota Access Pipeline is. I do know that the governor of North Dakota has substantial financial interests, um, but they're, they're not actually anything that's legally actionable. But I don't know what that, the, the problem with the, the Dakota Access Pipeline and its corporate shareholder structure is that it's got a lot of shareholders because um, hedge funds have bought in and so if you have money with a hedge fund, technically you own that share that the hedge fund bought for you. Mm -hmm. So that's actually how Jill Stein ended up being an owner of Dakota Access before she realized where her money had been invested in and she divested herself, right? At least I'm pretty sure she divested mm -hmm. herself. But that, that was like a, a kind of fake scandal. So, I wondered how much, does anybody have any estimates as to how much is the cost of the I don't I don't know off the top of my head I'm sure somebody's done the economic breakdown but um, and the, the group to go to to look for that is Earth Justice um, I think they're Earth Justice org or Earth Justice com or Earth Justice org because um, they actually keep a pretty good eye on who's been major investors so that, so that you know which banks you should be divesting yourself from short answer from that all of them put your money in a credit union. Um, you're going to cover a lot more things here, or is this a general? Are we have a QA? Yeah, this is a general. I think this is a general QA. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, back to what we just said. Just so they know, Menards is the company you want to invest from. Here in, here in, are you familiar with their connection? Scott Walker mm -hmm. is dumping uh, chemicals with him. Yep. For that. Is there any other source that they can get these Unfortunately, from? no. What about Lowe's? Oh, ah, you're right. Lowe's, um, it's a little bit more of a drive, but Lowe's is, is available, but I don't know if there are any better. Um, but a lot of, at least in terms of being able to get gift cards, probably the easiest way if you want to give money to the, to the camps is that there's two, and it's right on the webpage for Sac Sacred Stone, there are two funds. One goes to the Legal Defense Fund, which currently has, a, last I looked at it, about a million dollars in it. Um, and then there's another fund for the running of the camps, and that's how we buy like eggs um, and building supplies and all the rest of that. Unfortunately, one, Amazon doesn't really need to deliver it standing around too consistently. <laughs> they confiscated all our drones. Uh, oh yeah, drones. They took them away. They took they, they which is that's right, they made illegal. Them flying, though, didn't they? Oh yeah, which is that's going to be a fun court case too. Um, yeah. um, maybe other people know about this. I think one. I think it's the CEO of the Dakota Pipeline is also owns a record label, and some of the musicians are starting to boycott him. Jackson Brown. One of them. Yeah. I haven't, um, I'm willing to bet, but I haven't actually looked for it, and I'm wondering if Earth Justice or just the camps themselves have a divestment list. I know that they do for the banks. So, so if you go to Sacred Stone's website, they will. They have a number of places of how you can help if you can't come out to the camps, which is ideal. Um, you can donate money, or they actually have a whole whole section on what you can do for organizing within your own community, who they're suggesting you divest from, um, and then you know the the type of coordinated actions 
that they've been doing. So you'll see like Toronto had a big um, march, what the students are doing here in Madison. Um, they have ideas for that on their webpage. So you can try and ask the questions. Oh, okay. I don't know if you just said something about Amazon, but I know there's a link you can go to Amazon and buy like Hunter Carhartt yep. overalls and stuff. Is that kind of stuff getting through, or is that coming from Bismarck and it's, getting stopped? Or? It's, so that's the, the wish list, um, the Amazon wish list, and I do think it's getting through. It's just inconsistent. And that's not so much a problem of they're getting targeted so much as it's Standing Rock Reservation and enough deliveries when you live that rural. Always kind of. It's always a kind of issue. How do they know if you're going to Bismarck and you're bringing Things like in a box or whatever, stop every car? Or they're not stopping every car, but the ones that look like we're obviously bringing supplies. So, my friend Brooke and I, we're renting a U Haul trailer. It's uh, this huge U Haul trailer. Oh, okay. right? um, we're kind of obvious. So, if you're not being like really obvious, like you have a truck that's completely packed, like we were last time, um, you're probably going to be fine. But if you look like you're bringing supplies, then they're stopping you. I wonder if I could ask you to speculate a little bit on, and you might not even want to do this, but what does the company, like, they're clearly trying to build as much as they can before any kind of legal action or whatever. Much of this is probably illegal already. Are they, are they hoping that they will pass some critical threshold and that Somebody will say, well, they've already gotten this far. Do you, can you? I don't know. Um, most of my work tends to be with human rights. And so my impression of what the Dakota Access Pipeline is doing is sort of the same thing that you see out of countries that get slapped by the, the human rights courts, where they'll just take the fine, right? So. Basically, it's not a criminal behavior, and unless there's an injunction, or unless there's a court order to take the pipeline down, all they're going to be hit with are fines, and they may have done a cost-benefit analysis, decided to build it because the amount of money that they'll get once it's up and operational will outweigh any of the, any of the fines that they'll, they will take for what they've done. So that's, that's the, my best guess, but that's just, Pure speculation. I have no. So there's no criminal liability for, for example, going as, under the lake. As far as I know, no, because it's it's not. Yeah, this wouldn't really live in the realm of criminal liability. It's all within civil and regulatory statute. Um, so the, the the question is where, which is where most environmental law is, right? There's can't really. There's not much that's criminal. But unfortunately, when we end up talking about legal actions, that that's the assumption. And so people won't go to jail for this. What they will is how many fines will they get? Or if there's an injunction or a court order to stop, um, that's what they're looking at. Any other questions? What about um, court cases from the, the protectors that were bitten by dogs and otherwise be considered like injured or they have? Those, yeah, those are civil court cases that I, I think I haven't been involved with those, but I think Red Owl is um, organizing a civil suit against, because from my understanding, it wasn't the police department's dogs, it was the, right, it was private security. So that would be a civil suit against um, Dakota Access. So that's a, I haven't been handling that because it's not my value, but I don't do that type of law. Criminal stuff, A-OK. -okay. This stuff, yeah, it's not bad. Um, there was a woman, I want to say, in Redstone? Yes, she no, has been. She, not that one, actually. You might to explain it. OK, so Red Fern is um, Red Fawn? Red Fawn. Red Fawn or Fern? Yeah, Red Fawn. Um, she's one of the major uh, organizers for, I think it might be Red Warrior. Um, which is one of the main camps, which is one of the forward action camps. And she's been very involved, actually, from everything I've heard about her, she, she tends to be um, one of the people who will help quiet down situations, make them calm. 
um, she was targeted, and then they have accused her of threatening police officers with a weapon. Um, it used to be that, that she had shot at officers, and now it's just gone to threatening them with a weapon because there's, <laughs> thank you iPhones, we've got video of all of this, and it's like, what gunshot? <laughs> Come on guys. Um, despite the fact that there was a agent provocateur from the Dakota Access Pipeline who did bring a semi-automatic weapon into the camp, um, people in the camps basically restrained him, took the weapon away, and he hasn't been charged with anything. So. And what's up with her case? She's, she's been, the, I think she's been released. Um, but she's on bond like most people um, and I'm not sure what her charges are if they've been officially filed yet but they had her they didn't really they if they released her I think they released her very recently but I haven't checked up on it um, the, one of the problems particularly about getting legal information is one people tend to be a little bit reserved with saying exactly what the legal strategies are and two communication out can be a problem with the camp simply because cell phone service is really spotty. Like it's really spotty at the camp. So you, you play the dousing for service game um, a lot. Any? Yeah, um, water protectors. Now, the, under the lake mm -hmm. and from the Missouri River, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. It's already under the lake, the pipeline, or not? Not yet. No. And, all right, so and then obviously the river. Right. Um, I heard an interview with one of the, I, don't, I, I believe it was, I don't know if he was an elder, one of the tribe, saying about the water. But he said, we'll help you re, reroute this pipeline and we'll work for you somewhere else. I think a lot of people there are really just true oil, want no pipelines, right. keep it in the earth. Is that how most of the tribes are? Like, just not out of the water, let's just move it away from our tribe. I mean, our from Space Dandy Rock itself. Well, it, it depends on who you're talking to because what the tribes are saying is not this pipeline. Um, if we can't stop it, then let us, re it, it's, it's sort of an attenuated answer, right? So ideally, keep it in the ground, we don't want it, period. If that's not a possibility, then at least don't have a pipeline, right? If you're, if you're going to, we would prefer you not frack. This is, this is argument one. This argument fails, then okay, no pipeline. If that argument fails, then okay, pipeline that's not near anybody's water, and that's sort of the end of. So it, it's firewalls, mm -hmm. right? Because um, at the it, end of the day, it's four, protecting water. On that note, is there? I think there's a four other pipelines that are go under the Missouri already. I don't know. I believe. I, I think there is. I don't know. Was there any protests when those were made under the river? I'm curious. Does anyone know? I don't know off the top of my head. I only know about what's going on with Standing Rock specifically um, because I started getting involved when people started getting arrested uh, because that's where my legal expertise can help. So, environmental law, not really my thing. I've been doing a lot of learning on the fly, um, but it, not my specialty. I will, can I just add something? I mean, I think there's like strategy behind this when they do that is a lot of times people don't know. Right. You know, I think of all the fracking that's going up in northern Wisconsin and near like my, all of a sudden one day people were like, there's a big mine, you know, just down the road and we had did a, like a lot of heads up that it was coming. And I think there's reasons behind that. They don't want us to know. They don't want us protesting. They don't want these things happening. They want to kind of, come in, let things happen. And I think same goes for the spills. You know, when you start talking about it, you talk about people and you start researching it, you find out that these things spill a lot more than, you know, it's not just like a one-time thing. They're spilling, you know, all the time. And part of it is, from what I understand, the technology, particularly for pipelines that go under the ground, is that there's no way to spot check them to see if they've got a slow leak. And the way that the pipelines indicate if there's been a breach or a leak is a massive change in pressure. So if it's a slow leak, there's no change in pressure. There's no way to know until that stuff starts bubbling out of the ground. So that's that's also one of the, the environmental impact arguments that's being made in the court case. Um, but I don't know how many pipelines go under the Missouri. It's a big river and where at. Um, 
and there's also different types of pipelines. So there's a natural gas pipeline, um, there's oil pipelines, so it's, it's a question of what type of um, thing you have a pipeline for. But to get the oil where they want to get it, it's got to cross Missouri, is that correct? I, I think it does. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't looked at the rerouting arguments. <clears throat> Mostly with the defendant of the picture. Oh, speaking of that, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt on your details. Tribal police. I, BIA, yeah. Now, how are they? Are, are they like like with, no. with the water protectors, kind of in the uh, middle, or? Uh, okay. <laughs> this gets a little, this gets into to federal Indian law and gets a little complicated. So, the way that tribal court, or the way that tribal criminal jurisdiction works is that the um, Morton County Sheriff has no jurisdiction over native um, enrolled members of Standing Rock or other, other Indians who are on reservation lands. So they have no control over that. If you're white, they do. So they can follow white protesters to hypothetically to Sacred mm -hmm. Stone, which is the reason why they kind of prefer you to stay at Oshet Sakaline, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, the reason why, so if, if they, I'm a little distracted. If they, they being the police, they have no jurisdiction over any American Indian and federally, member of a federally recognized tribe on reservation land. They do have they do have jurisdiction over a non-native on reservation land, so they could technically follow a non-native onto reservation land, which is why it's preferred if you come to if you come to Standing Rock and you come to Cannonball, you not stay at Sacred Stone necessarily, right? Or if you do, please don't have any confrontations with the police because that can give them um, jurisdiction to come in, right? I'm trying to avoid that. The other thing with, so the tribe has its own police through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They have limited jurisdiction over anything. And what they're trying to do is avoid confrontations between the BIA police and um, the Morton County um, police. BIA doesn't have any jurisdiction off of reservation lands, so it can, they can help maintain peace and security and order for Sacred Stone, but not for the other camps because they're not on the reservation itself. So they're kind of a non-entity in this. They're not, they're not really involved simply because their jurisdiction is so limited in this situation. They really can't do anything. And they can't do anything even if you're not native. Yeah, but in the, in the, the this guy who supposedly worked for DAP mm -hmm. came on with his pickup in a Rifle. Right. Uh, ultimately, wasn't it the reservation police that arrested him and then they turned him over or mm -hmm. something like that? Because he came onto Sacred Stone. He came across the lake or across the river into Sacred Stone. And so they could do what they can do is if there's an immediate threat to peace and security of the reservation, they can detain, but they can't prosecute. They can't, all they can do is detain. They can't arrest and charge. So then he, he has to be turned over because he's not native. If he was native, they can keep him in the use of tribal courts and we're off to the races. But since he's not native, then he has to be turned over to somebody who actually has jurisdiction over him. I think. But the opposite is true. If I'm native, so if they're outside of the not they necessarily. Can be arrested by federal police? Yes, if they're off reservation. Right. But what a tribe can do is, is sort of reach into non native jurisdiction to pull their people back out and into tribal courts. It's tricky and it's hard to do and it depends on the level of crime that has been charged. So they can't do it with a murder charge, but they can do it with like kids who've been caught shoplifting, which just tends to be more when you see that. Still seems like it's about the standard. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Being ignorant, but how do they tell who's yeah, tribal and old cards. Oh, you do. Yeah. So I, so I'll say pull me over, and I don't have that card. They assume that I'm not. Yeah. Because, okay. You don't. I didn't know that. 
Yeah, you have tribal ID. Do you have tribal ID? Yep. Card? No. Oh. Tribal identification card. So I get all of my paper processed. I'll have Cherokee Nations, which is really pretty. Do you use AAA? Yes, and it's it's completely okay for voting. It's a photo ID. It's a photo ID. It looks just like a driver's license. I'm just wondering, uh, do we know anything about where the people of North Dakota stand? Because at one point they were a pretty, you know, a pretty radical state. Uh, is, there, is it monolithic against the Native Americans? What, what are we finding out there? My experience is that there's, it's a, a lot of people in North Dakota aren't really aware of what's going on. They're getting it through, you know, news media sources which are painting people to be radical extremists who are scary, mm -hmm. right, and bringing down the property values. Um, there are definitely landowners who feel like they've been coerced into accepting this pipeline who are now on the side of, of Standing Rock. There are some who want it to go through because they've gotten a lot of money, and so they are for the pipeline, and it, it's a, there's definitely not a monolith. There's a lot of, I think, ignorance within the non-native population. Um, but yeah. So. And yeah. they did vote for the forest. Sorry, you had an interesting you know, point about how much water flows over a pipeline, mm -hmm. say a river and such. Right. Where would I find information? We're part of the Rock County Pipeline and we're at and we're trying okay. to focus a bit where it's crossing under the rock or people where Enbridge is playing right. second line. I think those are the way are, it goes now, gonna go. Mm -hmm. I I think it's an EPA regulations where they, they talk about what triggers, what standards trigger. I don't think it's a court case. I think it's, I think it's within the federal regulations themselves. But if you read the court case, the brief that the, the tribe has submitted, um, the Standing Rock, I think it's Standing Rock Reservation versus the Army Corps of Engineers that's currently moving through federal court, they have a citation to that um, set of regulations or the court case if it's but I'm pretty sure it's regulations. <coughs> what are the long-term implications of our environment now? Our environment? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, not an environmental <laughs> analyst. No, I, I mean it's okay. It's, it's just I, I think mean, it's I, a good answer. I think too. That's where there's concern. Is we as a country should be moving away from this type of so pipelines, drilling, and, and like let's work towards renewable, you know, where we're, we're figuring out a way to oh, honor the climate and not destroy or destroy our earth. But my fear is with who was elected last night, we know that those are, are not something that he, you know, he's very into the coal, into the pipelines, into the drilling, and, and into the money that goes along with it. But that's actually another point of content of conflict between the tribe and the governor's office is the tribe is very invested in wind. Um, it has wind farms. It's very invested into green energy, renewable energy, whereas the current governorship is invested into fossil fuels. And so that's a that's a point of contest between you know, very com very competing views of where we should be getting our energy and how we should be doing it. So all of the energy at the camps is through solar power. We're entirely solar power, except now we're a little worried about winter and so propane, unfortunately, because it's kind of cold. Well, the, the new assignment, the uh, EPA uh, guy that's going to be the heading it up, just announced tonight, comes from a group that is... The Competitive Enterprise Institute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The funder is EXA. Yeah. And he's a self-denier yeah. of climate change. He's a very Everything. Yeah. Just came in. One of the things. Sure. One of the things that's encouraging about this, you know, is the fact that what I've heard is you know from these native uh, yeah. came together on this. That this was really like historic. Can you elaborate it, more on that? It is historic. So you have every tribe in the, the United States, including, and then a lot of indigenous peoples from Latin America, from Hawaii. Um, I think 
think last week, um, a delegation of shamans came from Mongolia. Um, people from Russia have come. So there's a lot of indigenous people, a lot of indigenous people, but every, every tribe in the United States has sent people. Um, and it's been peaceful. So it's kind of like a big powwow in a lot of ways. There's been a lot of dance. There's been a lot of dance, which is fun. Um, are we ready to wrap up? Well, I, I heard that uh, kind of earlier, wasn't it Dane County Sheriff sent the deputies to there? He was asked the same yeah. again. Yeah, they had and, sent. Uh, then the people put a lot of pressure on him to call them back. back. Yep. And then the uh, Rock County Sheriff also was I don't, requested. The sheriff and, rewrite the exposure? Was that what? Did he send them? No. No, he uh, was going to, but then there was an issue about overtime on Saturday. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and who was paying? Yeah. He pulled, he pulled them back. I think that there's been a Waukesha. There's a uh, Waukesha? Yeah. Yeah, Waukesha County has sent, that and they're still sense. there. Yeah, that but that is the fun. Another tangible thing people can do. I mean, yeah. here it looks like you guys already did that, but I know Hennepin County in Minneapolis had sent people out, and Minneapolis actually has a really strong Native American Indian community. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so they pressured them, and they pulled their place back. They pulled them back? Yeah, yeah. they pulled them back. Hennepin did. Hennepin County did. I've been there. Also putting pressure on the unions, because right now the unions are sort of divided as to no. right. on who they are supporting whether they're supporting the water protectors versus whether they're supporting Dakota. So Trumka on September 30th issued a statement basically calling the protesters extremists and saying that the pipeline represented good jobs. Um, and then the Labor's International of North Dakota has been very pro-pipeline because the pipeline is, this is not one of their sins, they are using union labor. Um, so it is going up with union labor. However, a number of unions are start, are supporting Standing Rock, actually. That list is much bigger. So um, SEIU, the Labor Coalition for Community Action, which is actually an AFL-CIO subcommittee. So AFL-CIO is divided within itself. Um, California Faculty Association, the Coalition of Graduate Employees, um, the Teaching Assistants Association, my unit. Um, American Federation of Teachers, the Communication Workers of America, the Amalgamated uh, Transit Union, the American Postal Workers Union. Um, yeah. That's the list nurses there, yeah. must be on there. Oh, yes. Yeah, they are not. I managed to. Yeah. Actually, I think just the nursing union, the National Nursing Union. You have, is there a casino out there? Yes. What way are they going? Uh, the casino is run by the tribe. Yeah, are they helping? Yeah. The, the casino is run by Standing Rock Reservation. It's um, where you go to get Wi Fi, get the power. <laughs> right? The casino has been really helpful because you can go there, get gas. Um, not for free, unfortunately, because the tribe doesn't want to recoup on that. But you can shower for free? They have been blocking them or Mm -hmm. Or the tribe. The tribe, it, the tribe runs the tribe. casino. No, I mean outside people walking. Oh no, I mean it's on the reservation itself. Oh, I see. Yeah, so it's on it's on the res, so you can't really, which makes it a really useful place to to go and you know recharge your laptop and stuff like that. Which it always makes it kind of interesting because you, you see people from the community who kind of don't really have any idea what's going on, and then you you see the water protectors, and we're kind of like. Muddy and grungy. Look like we've been in the river a lot. Are there, is there a lot of uh, Indian artifacts and history of that time? Any things going on? That's actually the one of the points of that's the reason why the Army Corps of Engineers went out October 20th to do the assessment is because there had been a new archaeological find of artifacts and a, a burial site, which that's what was bulldozed. Right afterwards. Yeah, almost yeah. literally two days after we made, after they made the find. Uh, so. I was pretty much thinking right at the beginning of the winter. And yep, that's the plan. That's the plan. It's been the plan since September. Is that we're just staying.
So that's why we have yurts from Mongolia. <laughs> A what? A, a company that makes the yurts. Yeah. Was sent into the reservation. Yeah, that's uh, we got some from Mongolia. We got some who built off of their design. Yeah. yeah. Or made in North Dakota or something. Yeah, I think so. Um, they're really, yeah, they're really neat for very long, um, and they're movable, so you can break them down and move them around if you need to, which is nice. But the, the camp consolidated, I think, a week, the week after I left um, into what's going to be their winter sort of form um, to conserve heat and to make it easier on elders to move around. Um, shovels, the, shovels would be tough. What do you say the numbers are? How many people are there today? Are there peak well, or ongoing? Right now, what I've heard is we've got 3,000 people who are permanently living in the camps. And then, Three? Thousand? Thousand. 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 Three thousand. Um, that's what I heard. Um, there's people come in and go, so during the weekends you have a lot more people because people like me will be like, okay, come down for like um, Thursday through Tuesday and then be back. And then you have people who stay for three, four weeks at a time, go back, come back later, and then you have people who are just staying. So What's the population of the Standing Rock Reservation? Well, of the yeah, Native American population that's normally there. I don't know. 8,000. Oh, thank you. Something like 8,000? 8, 8,000, yeah. It's a big res. I can't call. I can't. You have it? Yeah. <laughs> so there's this 3,000 3, people that have left the reservation and went to the camp. I don't know if it's people who are from the reservation because I think a lot of people are like me. Like, okay. I haven't been back to Standing Rock Reservation. And, 2007 was the last time that I was on Standing Rock. There's a lot of people who are coming home. Um, so people who were born on Standing Rock Reservation and, and left and are now coming back and staying. So. You get people just spontaneously showing up. Yeah, a lot of people spontaneously showing up. So tactically, based on what you said earlier, they can, they can conceivably build right to the lake. And tactically, it's a very good deal if they start drilling or whatever they're going to do. Yeah, that's and the reason why we have a camp that's literally right they where they want to drill. See what they're doing. Uh, so what, so you can see, you can see them from standing. You can see them from Sacred Stone. Right? The land is really flat, and they're not that far away. And that's the reason why the 18, 1868 camp was where it was, and the reason why that was a militarized raid was that it was literally right on top of where they wanted to go. And we just, you know, put the camp back there. They raided it, we put it back. It's fine. I mean, they drilled right under the Mississippi. Yeah. They've done that, you know. Uh, so the 1864 camp is still there? 1868 camp uh, was raided and it was gone. And now what I've heard from friends of mine is that they're putting up another one. Oh. So you, you get, you know, feisty Lakota boys. <laughs> they build another bridge? Not a bridge, they have a, a, a camp that they're staying, and then there is the bridge between um, Red Warrior and uh, Sacred Stone. So, and that's kind of how we're shuffling stuff back and forth because it's easier to come up through the um, reservation through South Dakota as opposed to going through the checkpoints. So if you go up through South, South Dakota, you're not necessarily hitting any checkpoints, at least as far as I know that may have changed. It's a very organized movement. And I think what you were telling me just about some of the things too is, I mean, they're being really smart in strategy and how they're kind of organizing things. Yeah, and organizing it, and kind of shoving it at the stand. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so one of the clever ideas that somebody had was uh, under the Medicaid rules in uh, North Dakota, if you've been a resident, if you've been living in North Dakota for 30 days, you are eligible for Medicaid. Under the under ACA, under the, the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, there's a provision that allows an Indian healthcare provider to enroll some, a patient of theirs in Medicaid, and they have a presumption, a presumptive eligibility of 30 days, of one month. 
until the state makes a ruling. So until the state makes a ruling saying yes or no, they're presumed to be eligible for Medicaid, which then means the Indian health provider can bill all of their health, all of their um, <laughs> health, all of their services through the Medicaid program, which is how we're treating protesters or water protectors who've been hurt by you know all the rest of that. So that's that's how we're funding a lot of the medics, uh, which then makes the state have to pay the medical bills for the water protectors. Yeah. <laughs> this is a type of strategy that, you know, you, you play the game that you've got, right? Yes. So. Um, do you know the public wax prophecy? I do. So the black stick prophecy, the one that I was told is that, um, well now that I've said it, I can't remember what it was. Out of the north, there will be a black snake that moves through the land, killing all it touches, turning the water into poison, and all of the tribes will come together to kill it. That's the prophecy that I heard. So. I hope so. Otherwise, it's the, I mean, it's an end of the world prophecy. So. Yeah. <laughs> I know if I want that one. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for having us out. Thank yeah. yeah. Thank you. If you want to stay updated, um, you know, go to Bo all the camps there have really great run social media pages. Yep. So that's where I get all my updates. I found activists that are on the ground and follow them on Facebook. Dallas Gold Goldtooth. Yep, Dallas Goldtooth. Um, he's like an old family friend. So my aunts, my mom's and my aunts are so thrilled because he's like all over social media and is like really risen to um, be a, a really big leader out there. But that's places to go to find information that isn't being kind of spun or twisted by the media or going directly to Native, um, Native American mm -hmm. news sites. So uh, Indian Country Media Today is a good one. Indians.com is a good one. What was the other like Native News. Native News. Yeah. I was just whiny about their website, that's all. <laughs>